Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, session one of the Sri Lanka Economic Summit. Uh, just coming off the inauguration session, uh, we're now going into uh, deep diving into the sessions relevant to the theme as well. Uh, and this session will really explore the global and local economic landscape as well as the outlook, but also uh, get the views and perspectives of uh, the business as to how uh, they will navigate the domestic um, uh, circumstances and also uh, the global uh, situation as well. Um, so in our, uh, in our session today, we have uh, four, four resource personnel, uh, two speakers. Uh, the first you will hear speaking will be uh, Eric Robertson, uh, Global Head of Research and Strategy uh, Standard Chartered Bank, um, who will then be followed by the Governor of the Central Bank, uh, the Shamania Professor W.D. Lakshman, and following which we will move into a panel discussion uh, with two uh, corporate uh, giants, two corporate heavyweights, uh, Deshamani Mahesh Amalin from uh, Chairman of MAS and Krishan Balendran, Chairman of uh, John Kills Holdings, where we'll um, continue our conversation as well. Um, so without maybe further ado, maybe let me invite Eric uh, initially to provide uh, his remarks and his presentation. Great, thank you everyone. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, before I start, uh, I'd just like to say a few words of thanks uh, on behalf of the Chamber for, for having me today and for, for allowing me to, to join what is really a very special event uh, in, in pretty unusual times. Uh, you have heard and you will continue to hear today from a number of your local experts. Uh, and so what I thought I would do uh, for you today is maybe offer a little bit of, of the global perspective. Uh, some of the things that, that we are thinking about and, and exploring with, with our clients at, at Standard Chartered. Um, look, let me start uh, by making a couple of comments. Um, the obvious ones are that we have endured uh, the worst economic crisis uh, since World War II. We have endured potentially the worst global health crisis uh, since World War I and the Spanish flu. Uh, and yet, we have found ourselves uh, in some places and in some markets experiencing uh, what is arguably a fairly spectacular recovery. And so understanding that disconnect between the economic challenges uh, and the financial market response, I think is, is critical to understanding what uh, 2021 will, will hold for us going forward. Uh, the second point I would make is that perhaps today and, and over the next few years, more than we can all remember for a number of years, politics uh, plays a key factor in our business decisions and our investment decisions and our planning decisions. Uh, the US election obviously plays a big part in that. Uh, some of the recent trade deals which have been signed across the region in, in Asia and Asia Pacific are, are another example of that. And I think we will continue uh, to have to understand how these political and, and diplomatic and, and trade relationships uh, evolve. Uh, you've already heard from some of our distinguished uh, speakers and guests, far more distinguished than myself, the importance of supply chains uh, and the importance of trade, especially for uh, countries and economies like Sri Lanka. Um, and I think that will continue to be uh, a net positive uh, for the global economy. Uh, but let me stop there and then go into some of the more specific items that I, that I wanted to share with you today. Um, in spite of the global economic and health challenges, uh, there is a, a silver lining that we have seen already and that we continue to expect to see in, in 2021. And that's on trade. That's on exports. Uh, as an example, when people talk about the recovery in global trade in the last three to four months of the year, most people will argue that global trade is still well below the levels that we had achieved pre-COVID. And that's factually correct. But what is less well understood and appreciated is that for emerging markets, especially in Asia, export volumes have already reclaimed their pre-COVID levels. And so emerging markets within the Asia Pacific time zone are benefiting from an almost unparalleled recovery. Now this recovery back to pre-COVID levels has taken two quarters, two quarters. After the global financial crisis, it took six or seven quarters. 
And so there's something very different about the recovery in, in trade. And that is the importance of Asia as a region uh, and the importance of countries within Asia to trade with each other. And as a statistic, uh, intra-regional trade today, especially in Asia, now makes up over 50% of global trade. And so when people talk about the engine of growth being Asia specifically, or Southeast Asia, or ASEAN and South Asia together, uh, these are real developments. These are real improvements. And so trade channels are going to be, uh, in many ways, a new part of globalization. Uh, and I think that's underappreciated by, by global businesses and global markets, and, and I think a net positive. Another net positive uh, is the level of interest rates. As we all know, global interest rates have collapsed. In many developed market economies, we have interest rates at or below zero. So the cost of servicing debt uh, remains extremely low. Um, and one of the reasons for that, in addition to the health and economic crisis that we've been through, is that inflation globally remains extremely low, uh, almost historically low in many, in many places. Now, set against some of these positives, which I've shared with you, there are obviously challenges. For most countries uh, and economies around the world, the ability to recover or to start the recovery in the last three to four months has only been possible because of the uh, extreme levels of both monetary and fiscal stimulus. Now, as you all know, uh, as well as I do, this fiscal stimulus comes at a cost. And so we are seeing budget deficits, not just in EM, but in EM and developed markets, uh, explode significantly. And with the increase in budget deficits, we are seeing debt to GDP ratios rise as well. And so the amount of leverage in the system uh, has grown exponentially, not only just this past year, but over the last three or four years. And that is a cause for concern going forward. Now, the good news is that with interest rates low and with inflation low, central banks, again, globally, have been able to absorb some of this debt issuance that we have experienced, right? Quantitative easing in the developed world and all other forms of monetary support have allowed governments in many cases to issue this extraordinary amount of debt. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that we're not concerned. When countries' debt to GDP level, uh, ratios go from, say, 35% to 60% over a five year period, that raises questions about the appetite of international investors for that debt. And the question becomes what will be the correct balance between investors and the central bank absorbing that, that increase in, in debt issuance? So there, there are challenges. But it is our uh, estimation that the combination of monetary policy support, the low level of interest rates, and the low level of inflation should create a, a platform for a better economic narrative in, in 2021. Now, let me make a, a perhaps more philosophical comment, but this is something that we in, at Standard Chartered Research believe wholeheartedly, which is that the recovery in 2021 will look and feel almost like a post-war recovery. Now, there's been no military engagement and um, the, the casualties that go along with that, but we have seen a similar sort of economic destruction as a result of, of the health crisis that we've been through. And so it's my belief that governments, central banks, the ratings agencies, and many of the multilateral organizations around the world that we all work with We'll see to it that the priority is economic recovery. Fiscal discipline is not being completely cast aside, but I think it will be uh, de-emphasized in the very short term in the name of growth. Now that will create some, some challenges in the future in terms of how we get governments back on a, on a sustainable debt path. But for the short term, growth is really the priority. And the good news is, again, we're seeing evidence uh, that growth is being prioritized at both the government level and the ratings agency level. Now, I just want to give some more specific uh, talking points to all of you with regards to the financing environment. <clears throat> Again, the good news is uh, interest rates globally have, have declined dramatically. 
By some estimates, uh, the amount of negative yielding debt in the world is about 25% of the total debt stock. In dollar terms, that's about $17 trillion. So for international investors looking for a sustainable source of return, they will have to go further afield in search of <clears throat> higher yielding assets. And it's our opinion and something that we share regularly with our clients that for issuers in the emerging market space, this is uh, an incredibly powerful uh, and important uh, leg of support for, for 2021. But the risk and the challenge, nothing is for free, as I said earlier, um, is that everybody has, has tried to take advantage of this. In the United States, for example, investment grade credit issuance in the year 2020 has reached nearly $2 trillion, right? a record by a magnitude of, of nearly $500 billion, right? versus the previous record. The US Treasury alone has issued in net terms, not gross terms, but net terms, roughly $4.5 trillion. Right? So in the United States alone, we've seen over $6 trillion of debt issuance. And so the concern for the future is that if this debt issuance pattern is maintained, there may be some crowding out. In other words, there will be uh, a scenario where we have a, a case of the haves and the have-nots, those who are able to tap capital markets and those who, if they're able to, they have to, to offer a, a significantly higher yield to attract uh, investors. Now, a final uh, comment that I wanted to make about the financial environment and how it supports the economic environment is with regards to the US dollar. Now, most of our clients are very focused on the idea that the dollar has started to depreciate, offering much needed support for global currencies around the world, especially in emerging markets. We get some questions about whether or not the dollar has lost its reserve currency status or is in the process of doing so. I think that's one step too far. I'm not concerned about that. That being said, I do think we can expect a meaningful dollar depreciation cycle over the next two to three years. Now, our research suggests that when the dollar depreciates, that offers a meaningful easing or loosening of financial conditions for, for the global economy, not just for the US economy. And I think that flies in the face of perhaps accepted wisdom, but I don't think that accepted wisdom is correct. A weaker dollar is actually good for everyone. Now, you might say to me, especially those of you who, who own businesses that are involved in exports, well, if my currency is stronger, uh, my goods become less competitive from a, a trade point of view. In the current environment where exports have recovered so strongly, I'm actually less concerned about currency strength being uh, a net negative for, for, for global exports, especially out of Asia. But what I do think is, is more important is that a stronger currency for many countries around the world against the US dollar makes their assets more attractive to international investors. And so in an environment of low interest rates and for, for many countries, a stronger currency or a recovering currency makes it easier to attract international capital. And so again, I think there is uh, a net positive there. I'll just make one final comment, um, perhaps preempting a, a question that I anticipate. Many people ask me, what could go wrong in 2021? Everybody seems to expect an economic recovery, fair enough. Uh, there are a couple of factors which make us nervous, not enough to change our view, but something we're paying close attention to. Uh, a resurgence in COVID and a, a disappointment with the vaccines is almost the obvious point to make. But I think another factor, and it resonates with what I've just discussed, is if we were to see a surge in inflation globally. Now, it's not our view, right? It's not our base case scenario. We expect inflation to remain low on a global basis. There are obvious exceptions, I know that. But generally speaking, we expect inflation to remain low. However, if that expectation proves wrong, then the dynamic of better growth, better financing conditions um, will, will become severely challenged. The final concern that I have is if we were to see renewed losses in commodity markets. Uh, for large parts of, of Asia, for emerging markets more generally, 
exports of commodities, uh, commodity receivables is a, is a key input into government finances. Uh, and if we were to see a renewed decline in, in oil prices, in base metals prices, um, I think that would put severe pressure on, on finances for a number of regions around the world. So it is, again, not our base case. In fact, we see the opposite, uh, but something we're paying very close attention to. <clears throat> um, those are, I think, uh, a, a good summary of our, our latest views. As I said, we are uh, in general, trying to lean more positively for 2021, driven largely by a, a recovery in, in trade and, and in exports and the rebuilding of supply chains, uh, but not without risks. So I'll pause my comments there. Looking forward to, to the Q&A and, and joining the panel. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Eric, for um, providing, I think, the outline within 15 minutes on, on the global um, landscape is also talking a bit about um, your views, some of the key themes that's um, heading to our direction in 2021. And I think some points we can really take into the panel discussion as well. Um, to all our participants tuning in, uh, don't forget to send in your questions through the Q&A uh, chat box, and we will uh, definitely ask them from uh, the panelists and the speakers who are part of this session.